Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Allison Burstein. I'm a member of the Adult Programs Department of the Education Division here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to May's In Conversation, which is part of our Thursdays at 7 series. Tonight's, converse, this, tonight's conversation is part of a series that aims to expand the realm of discussions that we host here within the museum and investigate the, a wide range of topics, ideas, and processes that kind of underpin the art that's on display here. So tonight we have the opportunity to be discussing the topic of utopianism, a broad topic that applies to both the Brooklyn Museum, Brooklyn Museum proper, and on global and personal scales. We have the honor of being joined tonight by Liam Gillick and Simon Critchley, who will be discussing the ways that their work intersects around this topic. Hello, uh, I'm Elizabeth Callahan. I'm the manager of adult programs here at the museum. Um, and when we first came up um, with the concept of, uh, of working with um, Liam Gillick, Gillick and Simon Critchley, we acknowledged that there was a certain amount of experimentation in their work. Um, so we approached them with the idea of maybe having an experimental form with our conversation tonight. And um, to our great pleasure, they were game. So um, I'd like to thank them for being willing to experiment with us and also thank Lucas Jones of Polity Books for coordinating all of us. Um, so the experimental format will be this. The audience will serve as moderator. Uh, we crowdsourced a number of questions via Twitter and Facebook, so thank you to those of you who have participated um, in those forums. So we're going to start them off with some of your questions. Many of the questions reference the wide array of fields and discourses that you both work in and explore within, and sort of what, what are the reasons behind doing so, and what are the, the criteria you use to decide when and how to engage with these different projects. Yeah, but I, I did hear this word impetus, and I think it's quite interesting because, <clears throat> in fact, the decision to function as an artist is, had nothing to do with impetus. It's too, um, that sort of word is, it implies too much agency. In fact, it starts with doubt, in a way. And it starts with a kind of series of denials or an, an attempt to differentiate yourself. And of course, what happens after time is people think that's an active decision or they think it has impetus or it has some motion. In fact, it often has a lack of motion. It's a, a series yeah. of denials. And as you get older, you start to kind of fake your own history or you trick yourself and you think you made dynamic decisions. In fact, a lot of the time you were sort of sitting in the back looking at someone thinking, I will not be that person. It has a kind of negative um, aspect. I don't know. About yeah. You. I don't think I made decisions to, I mean, retrospectively, you can construct that. Um, but why work in different media? Well, I mean, I, you know, I write for the most part, and then other things cropped up, and I'm curious, so you end up in uh, having friendships with people, occasions arising, which retrospectively can look like a certain plan, mm -hmm. but that's just not the way it is. So, and I think it's, I don't know, I, I enjoy a certain media promiscuity, so uh, so sort of I don't want to just be writing academic philosophy because that's but, but rather don't you, tedious. But don't you ever, I'm going to start interviewing you now, you I knew this would happen. <laughs> but don't you ever have this problem of um, what I call like the Baudrillard's photos problem? The worry. I mean, as a philosopher, there's, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but Jean Baudrillard, the, the sociologist, thinker, um, also took photographs. And when I was a kid, you were supposed to read Baudrillard because he mm -hmm. did write some really important stuff, especially in the 70s. And, um, but you're also aware that he took photographs. And the photographs were kind of a problem because the photographs were, they were in the coding of photographs. I mean, they were things like a duck on its own or like a kind of a sunset or, they seemed to completely erase and deny um, most of the things he wrote about, strangely mm -hmm. enough. So I think it's important to explain that, that from my perspective, your engagement with, with, with other mediums and other things is not on that level. It's not like a, it is sort of integrated for me with your reading and writing and, mm -hmm. don't you think? Or maybe I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, but it's also that, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I began by doing different things badly, so, beginning writing poetry, doing, playing in bands, doing that badly, 
unsuccessfully, then writing poetry, doing that badly, uh -huh. uh, unsuccessfully, and then stopping, thank God, at a certain point. And then you discover this, this form of writing, which you can sort of do, but which I see as a secondary activity. So, you know, I guess... Which, what which it, thing is secondary? The writing well, I, or the... I think that, I mean, you know, the... Um, uh, I mean, you know, faute de mieux, as they say in France, I could have been a novelist, or I could have been an artist, or I could have been a musician. Didn't work out that way. I can read texts and do a certain number of things with them, and maybe some interesting things happen. But I don't think of that as, um, as, as, as primary or particularly original work. Mm -hmm. If other people find it uh, interesting, well, that's good. But I see it as a kind of uh, like default position. Or so for me, I guess what's essential is the um, that things emerge out of an experience of failure, right? A self-consciousness of failure. But I um, always think that sounds to me. I mean, I kind of know what you mean. But it, and I found myself writing something similar today, and I think of it as really age-specific. It's the kind of thing that I find kind of nauseating when it comes out of you know, the mouth of someone my age, because I think it's, it's a sort of mere culpa in a way. And I know what you mean, of course, but it's something that I think you maybe, uh, um, it's too difficult to recognize. To recognize that at the beginning is impossible, because of course it means you cannot act at all. So instead of maybe, what was the word? Impulse or impetus or something? Impetus, yeah. Impetus. Instead of impetus, which su suggests a kind of um, setting something to action, as in a rolling impetus, something gains impetus and starts to move. In fact, instead, what there are a lot of acts, like isolated acts of either defiance or action or actually often feeling left out of something, left out of a discussion or, or excluded. I don't know. Maybe this is not relevant to the but question. No, but, this, but this is because I was reading this interview with you in the Brooklyn Rail, um, this, uh, this issue of the Brooklyn Rail, and... Um, uh, what we have in common, which is interesting, is education at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. That one may want to be a rock star or uh, to write, you know, sub T.S. Eliot type poetry. And then you wind up through a series of accidents in an educational institution and you discover teachers. And those teachers, if you're fortunate, enable you to do something you didn't think you were able to do beforehand. So for me, you know, whatever, um, whatever it is that I call what I do, and I'm not sure what it is that, that, that I do, it's because of a, a series of discrete encounters with a number of, number of teachers. So the educational background is, for me, hugely important. And you were talking in the uh, interview about your experience at Goldsmiths as a student at a very particular point in that very particular mm -hmm. uh, institution in, uh, in, in South London, in dear old New Cross. And um, I guess, you know, what one hopes for is that there's, it's the question of one's own impetus is subsumed. You know, if, if, you're so, if you're lucky enough to discover teachers that will enable something to happen for you, then over a period of time, something be will begin to emerge. In philosophy, it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's a difference. You know, it seems to take, I mean, you know, the, the, the difficult thing in philosophy is, is having something like a voice. And the only way you develop a voice is through complex acts of ventriloquism. So what you learn to do as a student is to ventriloquize with different, different puppets, different dummies over a period of years. That puppet can be, you know, the Hegel puppet or the, the Derrida puppet, and you, you ape that, you ape those manners, and then after a certain point, something begins to emerge which is something like a voice. But it's funny, last night you talked about, you were t not the other night, you were talking about people you'd known or people you'd studied with who, and one or two characters you said had burnt out, like you used that phrase. And it, yeah. it's, it was suddenly as if we weren't talking about uh, philosophers or academics at all, we were talking about something completely different, even artists or something. I don't know many artists that have burnt out. I know some that have taken too many drugs, but maybe we were yeah. talking about that. But it's a funny idea, this being burnt out of ideas. And it, it does strike me that some of what you're doing is about being able to see the future. Do you see what I mean? That, that there must be some, 
<clears throat> it has a different speed, maybe. Maybe not, yeah. I, maybe not all artists are as neurotic as I am, but, but somehow it seems to project into the future, your work, to have the, the patience to do it, to have the patience to work. But maybe I'm misunderstanding or romanticizing how you work. Maybe well, no, you it's, work it's a, with no vision of the next five minutes, I don't know. No, you, there's a sense in which there is, um, you know, there are, having, you know, accepted that happiness is not going to be an option, right? <laughs> get, get, rid of, get rid of that question. And so, you know, um, given that happiness is off the table, then um, one, one works in a certain way and uh, a, a certain discipline, I guess another, you know, crucially important thing here is the, the acquisition of a certain discipline. And for me, that's a discipline of writing, which, which for me, I mean, this goes back to, I mean, this, this ventriloquism issue is very important because, um, you know, you learn to write through taking notes. This, this is totally banal, but hugely important. That for me, I mean, the most important aspect of my education was learning languages and then making notes on texts in foreign mm -hmm. languages for hours and hours and hours in libraries, at the end of which I'd have you know, a page and a half of notes in, you know, on, on a French or a German text or whatever it was, and then, and then, and then that was mine. And then seven, eight years later, somehow that would, that would find articulation in, in some way. The, the burnt out thing is that, I mean, you know, and this is another maybe, um, let's say this is, here's my fantasy about, about you, right? My fantasy about Liam Gillick is that, um, you know, Liam is, you know, really cool and does all this great stuff and he did it all so, I mean, incredibly young. And, um, and there were these other people doing similar things, all these other cool artists, some of them French, and, um, and they seem to form a group and there seems to be a movement and you think, oh, this is fantastic. Whereas for me, um, I can think of a when I was a graduate student, when I was 25, 26, 27, there was a group of us and then different speeds began to kick in mm -hmm. and, uh, and things got weird between people, people that I was uh, friends with and I sort of really respected. We ended up hating each other and falling apart or people couldn't write or they, they began to write and the next thing didn't happen. And then 20 years later, you look around and there are people, there are still people older than me who have, it's very important to have those sort of transferential relationships upwards and then the students at different levels. But uh, as it were, laterally, there's not terribly much. Whereas it's when actually, I look at you, you think, oh, you've got all of these people that seem to be part of a, a group. Yes, because it's the, the two big misreadings of contemporary art, well, there's many misreadings, but two of the primary ones, which are actually convenient misreadings, so the misreading of, of nationality and generation. And they're very convenient because, of course, you can just, it, it's a sustaining misunderstanding. So uh, there's, the, there's this illusion of horizontality, uh, as if yeah. you somehow have something in common with your generation, and maybe where you were born, or something like that. And of course, if it, people don't do much to break it down because frankly to break it down removes part of the fun of the kind of Oedipal aspect of being creative of course which is often real it, it does exist but it, it's not um, uh, it, it's it's easier to kind of um, to stick with it's 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 not that easy to really deal with really breaking down uh, generational hierarchies in a way it's much easier to stick in this kind of hovering thing so you know, particularly interesting for people who've just graduated from, from art school, there's the, an assumption that somehow collectively they've all come up with this kind of new generational solution, and particularly in New York, it even is the name of a kind of show that yeah. they do. And it's, such a, it's, it's, of course, a normal thing, but it doesn't help you understand anything about the work. It's a convenient misreading that sort of lumps together a whole bunch of people born at the same time as if that would help you understand something. And of course, superficially, it does seem to suggest something. It seems to suggest energy, uh, a, a limited degree of diversity, not, not in certain class ways and sense of identity, but certain diversity and a certain kind of dynamic unreadability, which is supposed to stand in for like art as a 
exciting thing. Yeah. But of course, a bit like anything else, you know, a doctor in, in, in the Philippines has much more in common with a doctor in Beverly Hills than all the doctors in the Philippines who were born at the same time, you know, do. Or all the people, oh, hang on, wrong, hang on. All the people born in the Philippines who went to that university or something like that. I'm not doing this right. You need to, there's a better way of putting this. Yeah, the Philippines. Something like that. <laughs> But I don't know anything about the Philippines. You, 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 I'm, I'm interviewing you now. So, you, so Liam, in a text that you wrote, you say something like, um, "I work in isolation, but I cannot. We cannot work in isolation." Mm -hmm. So it's this, there's this fundamental paradox of work. One works necessarily in isolation, but one cannot work in isolation. Therefore, collaboration becomes hugely important. Mm -hmm. Now, that's true for different domains of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of production of all kinds. In terms of contemporary art, and we could maybe think about what that term means, if it means too much or too little, and whether we ought to get away from it. That's another thing to think about. You know, there's this critique of contemporary art, the category of contemporary art in some of your recent stuff, which is very interesting. But it's in terms of the history of contemporary art, that 90s moment that you're part of, right, and that group of people that you are associated with, even if you have contingent things in common, still defines that thing called contemporary art. We're still living through that, that 90s moment in a way, which is, which is peculiar because it's some time ago now. Mm -hmm. um, so. And then, you know, then you become periodized. Then you become identified. You know, Nicolas Bourriot writes a, writes a book, uh, relational aesthetics becomes a term, and then there's a thing that one is part of. Right. Um, that never but ide ideally what you, what you want as an artist is to be in a position where you can deny being part of a group. I, a, anything else is a problem, unless you're a visionary or a genius or have or crazy at some level, or different. Because what you need, ideally, is to be able to say, I am not a pop artist, or I am not a minimalist, or I was never really a surrealist. And it's, in fact, the most decadent indulgence of an artist is, is to be able to do that. And of course, what you, see, um, what you see now, in fact, is um, very little attempt to define groupings. In fact, um, Nicola Burrier's book, Aesthetic Relationnel was really written towards the artist to try and get him off himself off the hook. Where as a curator, I think he realized he'd misread some of the work that we'd been doing, and he misrepresented it as well occasionally. So he wanted to write a sort of letter to his, in a way, friends to try and explain himself, and that's what became public. As but you see, I'd already been peripherally engaged with this kind of. Uh, young British artist thing. So I'd already right, benefited right. or I'd already been able to do, I've been able to do it twice. I was able to say to people, well, I was never really a young British artist. And I could also say, and I had nothing really to do with relational aesthetics. And this is a kind of incredible luxury that is more and more difficult to, to achieve, not because artists have really changed or contemporary art has really changed as a, as a terrain. It's a very uh, dynamic, um, well, it's not dynamic, it's the opposite. It's an incredibly slow-moving kind of uh, um, like lava flow that just tends to absorb things. But, but what happens is that, that there's been a lot more focus on, on curatorial practice as a discipline that's made people more reluctant to actually stick their neck out and claim anyone and to say, I will say that you, you, and you are doing this identifiable thing. Because the gen my generation, who were uh, born in the mid-60s, they started as critics, because you couldn't get paid as a curator. It was a non-imaginable job. It was still a terrain of work that was, w tended to be taken up either by accident or because you wanted to work in a museum. And, and people like Nicola started as critics, not as curators. It's only because they were writing that people thought why don't you organize an exhibition, seeing as you seem to think things have changed? And that's completely different now. Anyone under 40 that I meet who's interesting, um, 
tends to have studied curating at some level, and they've skipped the critic part. So what they're really fascinated to do is, is recuperation and uh, reanimation of things. And that does not include uh, a lot of the people in this room who are not ready to be recuperated or reanimated. And I've even sat in meetings at Bard College at the Curatorial Studies Program and heard people question uh, someone's thesis proposal on the grounds that they intend to look around them horizontally and try and do something to kind of identify something happening. The only time it's usually permitted is if the person, ident if the group, as it were, identifies some specific quality that is other than the received idea of what, you know, the dominant culture is. And then it's, it's, it's questioned, but there's a deferral to, to the young curator. But it causes, a bit of a, it causes a bit of a void, but it also allows something to last much longer. Historically, there's a reason for this, and there's a precedent, and that's Nouvelle Vague and French cinema, where almost everyone involved also started out as a critic. I was read first as a critic, not seen as an artist as well. Right. And this is the one thing that, this is the precedent for it. And until that happens again, nothing will happen, really. You'll have these kind of pseudo-movements, but you won't have, until people take the voice and take the, the text and rewrite a kind of present, you won't get the possibility of, a, of an actual movement. You'll get these weird ones, like younger than Jesus type ones, which have proper artists in them and real people, but then they're kind of, they're, they're actually pseudo groupings. They have no real meaning. Um, I guess what you're saying about um, an artist wanting to deny being part of a group or a movement, is that why you've chosen to collaborate sort of outside of the field? Specifically right here, you two have collaborated um, on two books now. So I guess I'm curious about the impetus for um, that collaboration, how that came about. Right, but the thing is that it's, at one point I worked with a lot of people in France and of course this word collaboration was something that they were extremely uncomfortable about using. And as we know in French history, the word collaborator doesn't sound right, doesn't sound very good. So we actually used to use the term work together. <clears throat> Shall we work together on something? And subsequently I've written a couple of texts about working methodology in relation to art, which try to suggest that certainly in Northern European and partly um, relatively privileged North American cultures that a lot of this sense of working together is actually rooted in changes in, in elementary school and kindergarten education in the 60s and 70s where the way of working was project based you're encouraged to go to school and like explore something, explore an idea or work together like you'll do this and I'll do this or have a non-hierarchical creativity and of course that still um, that I think is at the root of some of the feeling that this is a, a good way. It, it does have some psychological root, but it also is political because those teachers often were the most left-wing, the only really applied left-wing people you ever met. Like, they were the first ones to go on strike or the first ones to have a position or the first people to have a kind of politics that you met who were not like um, we talked about families the other night, but they had a certain dynamic. So this is, this is really important, this idea of working together. But it, working together can mean side by side and not face to face. And when I was young, of course, the artists who collaborated had an ampersand. They were like Gilbert and George or so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and when I worked with people, we don't work equally. It's more like, um, I don't, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it, but I wrote a very short text in 1989 uh, called the Scooby-Doo Complex, which was about the model, the Scooby-Doo model of working, which is like you and Shaggy go that way and me and Velma, Velma will get lost and then, you see what I mean, but you're actually kind of working together to solve something. And I've kind of suppressed this text subsequently, but, it, but I pitched it against what I called the Disneyic way of working, which is to create a kind of illusion of a, of a sort of a, of, a, of a character, the artist character, who becomes a kind of cartoon person who can do anything. You can be this figure who can, who can kind of become, who can sweep through culture and create these amazing images and, and uh, only notices it's going wrong um, in, a, in, in you know, that way you run off the cliff and it's only, you only fall when you, when you realize you're, you're in midair. <clears throat> the Disneyic, I always felt, was a kind of inherently right-wing 
model, a softly right-wing model of art, which was much more connected to people like Jeff Koons, or it had a kind of logic to it. And the Scooby-Doo model, which was um, um, Hanna-Barbera, I guess, um, was essentially much more to do with splitting up and meeting back somewhere. And if you work together, you work together in a way by accident. There's a lot of unmasking involved, unmasking the institution, finding out that the very person who was undermining you was the same person actually running the place, for example. So this Scooby-Doo thing actually was quite useful at the time. And also was deeply, sounded deeply unserious, therefore irritated even further the kind of pious and prissy guardians or gatekeepers of, of art at that point. In relationship to, I mean, um, I mean, there's an image of philosophy. Um, we could call it a, a Cartesian image of philosophy of Descartes in his oven in the Netherlands. Uh, ruminating on the nature of certainty, you know, and uh, coming to a series of conclusions which he publishes in the Discourse on the Method and the Meditations. It's this idea of the philosopher as this solitary character, that Rembrandt uh, painting of the philosopher. So we have that. And, um, but, and I guess this, this, this is a way into this, this question philosophy is group activity, right? Philosophy begins in a quite peculiar way. I mean, and the names are listed on the facade of the Brooklyn Museum on this side. It's extraordinary. You've got all the sophists <clears throat> right over there, Protagoras and um, uh, Gorgias and the rest, and then Socrates. Now, Socrates is this old man that likes younger men uh, who asks questions which have the form T Estine, you know, what is it? You know, what is what is it? And uh, they kill him. End of story. Justly, you know, because he was impious to the gods of the city and he corrupted the youth. And most of his students were reactionary uh, characters that wanted to overthrow democracy, which they did. Um, he dies. Then a school is founded called the Academy. We don't know much about these schools and we don't really know what they did, but they flourished in outside the city of Athens and then elsewhere across the ancient world. So um, if there at one level is the fantasy in philosophy of the individual producer, the thinker, you know, the thinker who's thinking difficult thoughts, then for me what's more important is the idea of the group. Right? The idea of philosophy as, as, a, as a group activity, a dialogical activity of back and forth. There are numerous problems with that, which I could go into. It, it's usually a group of men, with the exception of the Pythagoreans, who were mainly women, but Pythagoras probably didn't exist, and they were vegetarians, but it's a separate story. <laughs> but the um, usually men, and usually younger men, having a relationship to an older man. So... Um, what you have in the philosophical group is some kind of master figure, some kind of big other around whom the younger men congregate. And that still exists. Think about all those younger, uh, eager men that congregate around people like Badiou or Zizek or whatever, and they want, they believe in the master. Right? They believe that the master will, from his lips, something will fall, will write it down, and it will be the truth. So there's that. Uh, so for me, one of, the, one of the fantasies that I've been animated by in terms of my stuff is trying to group think in a way philosophically. It's very hard to do. Now, um, this sort of goes back towards the, you know, I guess the art world in, in a way. Um, the longest collaboration I've done is with this uh, novelist, Tom McCarthy. And Tom and I worked together for, you know, for about, I don't know, 12, 13 years or something like that. And um, this vehicle called the International Necronautical Society was developed as a vehicle within which we could do stuff. And we were interested in obscure corners of theory and modernist literature. And nobody in the academy or in certainly in literary circles had any interest, but the art world 
did it did have an interest. So we found that we were, we had a, our vehicle found a, a sort of garage in the art world and we did all this weird shit at the, in different places over a number of years. And then we wrote collectively. So that, I mean, that was, it's another thing to think about is that we had the, as it were, the anonymous persona of a society, right? the, the International Necronautical Society, and we could subsume whatever individual, individuality we had into that group and write in the persona of the society. That was interesting. But for me, it's been, I mean, given that the default position is me at home in my laptop, you know, trying to think of things to say, or, or teaching and feeling anxious, I mean, the, um, what I'm trying to do is to produce a kind of collaborational practice, a sort of promiscuous co series of collaborations whereby my intentionality is subsumed into something else. And I can ventriloquize in some other way. So when I was writing with Tom, I would fantasize mm -hmm. about being Tom, he'd fantasize about being me, and we'd go back and forth. I just finished a book with uh, my wife, which has been a very uh, a unique collaboration, which is a kind of um, hystericization of philosophical discourse in all sorts of interesting ways. We could talk about that. But what you end up doing is trying to uh, find some other voice. Now, in relationship to, you know, um, uh, I mean, we met through, uh, through Philippe Pareno, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I got to know Philippe, and, um, and what's interesting about Philippe Pareno's work is his sort of insistent, or his insistence, but his, his, his sort of relative withdrawal from, uh, from publicity, right? He's been involved in all of these uh, collaborations for all of these years, and only came out, as he says, he only came out as an artist whenever, you know, uh, a few years ago. Now, and, and I guess another aspect of this question is um, when I was looking at things by Philippe or Liam and people connected with that and uh, reading things by Hans Ulrich and uh, there was this idea of um, could there be a collective intelligence? Could we imagine a form of collective intelligence? And, um, and or could there be uh, could there be a way of um, reanimating what we imagine groups, say like the Situationists, were up to in the 60s, mm -hmm. where there seemed to be some sort of different form of organization and production? And um, sure, that's always going to be a fantasy, but it's... it's, it's um yeah, but it, it, the only way it can work is if it doesn't settle. It has to retain right. its, its lack of settling. And I think the artist Philippe Preno, um, he, whenever he senses something settling, he tries to agitate within the group. And I talked a lot in the past about this idea of, um, of how one functions within a group, not how one functions as an artist. I think artists kind of ego deployment or their work or their behavior is often masking a lot of things. You don't find out very much, you know, they work seriously or they hardly work at all or they do this and that. I'm much more interested in how they operate within the group. And that's not because um, I necessarily think you could find out anything by this kind of group think thing, but I do think you can find out something um, about their work by actually looking at the way they work with other people. But then I also realized that I think this word collaboration in the end, when you get to a certain point, might be a, to use the French form of it might be a more accurate form because, of course, collaboration usually has an, uh, uh, some... If you use that French understanding of the problem of collaboration, it is, out of, it is out of sync. It's not equal. You know, I get a lot of... I mean, it depends what you think of Simon, but if you think something of Simon, I get a lot back for doing the cover of a book, in a way. And yet, vice versa, um, you know, it's not equal, it's not even, it's not even-handed, and I think it's this lack of even-handedness right. that is actually what I find interesting about it. And it's more and more difficult to do, and it gets harder and harder over time, and it's right. something I've talked to people about before. The problem is, in fact, not the problem that you think it is, 
it, the problem is actually how to remain dynamic within the group, yet also find a way that you can take responsibility for your own actions, which means, of course, stepping out and saying, well, I'll take responsibility for that myself. And so you've got this dynamic between uh, the individual and the group that I think you'll see that almost any artist in the kind of post-war uh, or the last 50 years, it has to be kind of post-war because it's such a rupture, um, uh, has always had this strange relationship unless they, were, unless they came, reinvented themselves. So like Andy Warhol has to create his own kind of phantom group within which to operate because it's very clear that he cannot function alongside his contemporaries, that alongside Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, he's completely um, insecure. He cannot have like a, 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 maybe a kind of natural disagreement with them. You see what I mean? And it's this kind of sense of a sort of natural disagreement or a, that, that, that's actually quite hard to sustain. It's much easier to retreat like Anselm Kiefer to your castle somewhere or to retreat into uh, the art market. You know, the art markets, the problem with the art market is the place to retreat and hide in or to give up in. That's, you see what I mean? That a lot of these things to me are very That's interesting. Crucial. Anyway, maybe there should be another subject. I don't know. Question or subject. Maybe from the, from the uh, mob sourcing. So I don't like microphones. Uh, in various ways, you both... Um, you want to use the mic so you can... I Um, in various ways, you've both um, engaged with this issue of utopianism in your work. Um, so I'm wondering what you think are um, the unique potentials of your fields to contribute to an understanding of this issue. Um, well, the first thing I'd say would be that the philosophy as a field, let's say that, um, begins with a walk out of the city in the beginning of the Republic. Right? <clears throat> Socrates wanders down to the, the port of Piraeus and engages in a conversation about, about justice, which lasts for an awful long time, in the house of a metic merchant. And these details are very, very important. Right? It's, so it's outside the city, a metic as a foreigner. Okay. A foreigner who had rights of residence in, in the city of Athens, but who, who was not an Athenian. So, um, philosophy in, on that model, and there's an awful lot of ways of complicating it by that, let's just, but let's just keep it simple, begins with um, um, leaving behind the city and trying to, and, and, and criticizing the city and criticizing all the different forms of what it means to be a city, be it democracy oligarchy, tyranny, and the rest, and imagining another city, and imagining another city in speech. So philosophy begins by leaving behind, as it were, the, the topos of the, the place of the city, and imagining an, an, an utopos, you know, a, a numb place, and imagining that numb place in speech. Right? And to, to a, in a certain extent, um, at least the way I see it, the obligation of philosophy is precisely that. It is utopian. It's the, it's the you know, so the idea that philosophers should be uh, pragmatists or philosophers should be attentive to what is reality uh, always strikes me as counterintuitive. Philosophy is that weird, marginal, um, and parasitic practice which imagines another state of affairs, right? Another way of ordering human affairs. Um, and in that, so to that extent, um, philosophy is utopian, and philosophy is the imagination of a political vision of utopia, the imagination in speech of another way of ordering human affairs. So for me, there's a continuity between forms of um, philosophical reflection and forms of political utopianism. And there's a lot more I could say about that, but that's a sort of partial. I mean, to be glib about, you know, where I, where I grew up, Thomas More was a saint. Because if you grew up in a Catholic household in Britain, Thomas More was a saint, not just a funny man who wrote a book called Utopia. So 
I was, ma I was always, I came at it through that literary, that sense of admiration for St. Thomas More that, that still was there. So it comes slightly from, the origin of it is biographical and to do with identifying quietly and privately with someone that's not identified as a saint by the, by the dominant uh, culture. I, I noticed today on the BBC they had a clip of Prince Charles doing the weather forecast. And it's very good. It's I looked at the Daily Mail um, on, on, I like to look at the Daily Mail newspaper online because of the comments. And one of the comments, which no one knew whether to give it a plus or a minus, said something like, God's representative on earth, which of course, the queen is the head of the church in Britain. But of course, no one knew, they weren't thinking, they didn't know which direction to put that one. It stayed at zero. No pluses, no minuses. It was almost like people were allergic of this thing, like if they gave it a click on the computer, something bad might happen somehow. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, and Moore is killed, right? Moore right. is, you know, writes, I mean, there's the book of tribulation that he writes in, in captivity. He's executed for his beliefs. And, you know, another thing which is, I guess the same point, where there's, there's this extraordinary text by Erasmus, Enconium Morii, right? Praise of Folly, whereas the play on more and, uh, and, and madness, where um, Erasmus imagines, as it were, a complete inversion of the social order based around this ludicrous idea that there was this character mm -hmm. called Christ who got nailed to a tree in occupied Palestine right? 2,000 years ago. Isn't that strange? <laughs> and, and, you know, and, the, and what Paul says about uh, about Christ was what we have to think about is the folly of this, right? the madness of this. And this is also another way of imagining a different, uh, a different location. Right. So then what happened in about, towards the late 90s, people were looking at these new forms of, of working together that were not even-handed and they weren't the melding of a number of artists into one body or one voice, but they were hard to control maybe not as radical as some people claim, but neither were they as useless as some people make out. They were rather self-regarding, actually, and less, they had less desire to really change a relationship with an audience or a public than I think people imagine. But what I noticed started to happen is people would describe things as utopian. Not me and not any of my friends, but critics or certain curators had come up to you and say, yeah, we're thinking of doing a show about utopia or we're interested in these utopian projects you're doing. Now, the thing is, I'd grown up in the suburban London surrounded by public housing that was neglected right from the moment it was built because certain interests didn't want there to be well done public housing that was looked after and cleaned and maintained and uh, wasted on lazy people. Um, and so basically, I'd grown up with things being accused of being utopian my whole life. You know, the, 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 the housing, public housing was utopian. The, uh, the idea of a new public library that was actually designed by an architect and done properly was utopian. The idea of actually changing anything was utopian. That if you're in a union and you believe that there should be better rights for everyone in the society, that's utopian. And I grew up with that and I fa suddenly found myself as an artist doing quite practical work, sort of the opposite of what uh, Simon's talking about, but actually trying to play with institutions and play with the idea of art, still sort of trying to resuscitate the, uh, the body of art, as it were, and keep it alive. And you'd, lo and behold, you'd run into some dopey curator from Salzburg in Austria who'd say, I'm very interested in your utopian projects. And I'd say, they are not utopian. There is nothing utopian about them. This is an accusation. So I got very interested in this idea of the accusation of utopia as an applied thing. And you notice it's very common that, um, not used so much in, in the US, but certainly in Europe it's still used, the entire European social project is viewed as utopian by right-wing people, because the idea that you could have this kind of federation of states that could have decent sort of base level social services is essentially a kind of utopian dream right. invented by a bunch of lazy Greeks, you know, the contemporary Greek, cartoon, you know, the person who retires at 28 
and mm -hmm. doesn't do anything, is inherently corrupt, inherently bureaucratic. You know, it's an interesting thing. So I got very involved in it for that reason and would try and sort of pitch a kind of... Um, you, you found what had happened in art technically is people had tried to deal with utopia through appearances. And I was interested in it through acts and not appearances. So you had plenty of shows that were dystopian, but that just meant they were scruffy yeah. or they were abject, but they weren't actually dystopian. They were scruffy and abject. Yeah. And you had utopian projects that were shiny and participatory. And, and I, I've constantly been trying to um, uh, agitate some of this, but I don't have the philosophical um, uh, whatnots to do it properly. Yeah, but the model is, I mean, you did this stuff in um, um, your fascination with Volvo, mm -hmm. right? your fascination with Swedish car production techniques in the early 70s, there's this text, mm -hmm. what may be factories in the snow, and this text, maybe it would be best if we, if we worked in groups of three. There's a kind of, um, I suppose that would be a critique of utopianism, right? So he, yep. here, was, here yep. was, if we look at Swedish car production, in Gothenburg in, in this period, here we had a different way of organizing production, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which disappeared for reasons that we could, or has, has come in, under crisis for reasons that we could document. But that could be, come exemplary? But those, could no, no, become, but those, those people in, in Sweden were the architects of their own redundancy, as much as anything else. They, they found once they'd in, instilled a kind of horizontal working practice, where people managed their own, their own uh, actions, that they first managers became somewhat redundant. They didn't actually literally know what to do. They had lost their authority. But secondly, and maybe it's because a lot of Swedes are Calvinists or whatever they are, Lutherans or something, they, um, they work in a different way or they think they are working in a different way to other people. So they tended to rationalize their own production in their own spare time. And this created, uh, I was interested in it because it's really an, uh, uh, an early example of what became very common in the society. Like if you work even in a, it's very easy to, to look at labor and work through, through um, the filter of like education and say, and talk easily about and quite rightly about how education can make people free and it can make them, put them in a better space. But in fact, at the base level of it, a university professor's Ex the expectations of a university professor now and someone working in, in a big box store are similar. They're supposed to manage themselves and in a way manage their own redundancy potentially. So that they already are aware of their own kind of limits and their own expendability while they're actually working. Which creates, of course, um, a very interesting dilemma that in a way you are enacting a kind of freedom in a way, a kind of control of, over time, of your own time. But by doing that, you're also creating the conditions of, for your own redundancy. And this I found extremely interesting that this had been developed and applied very early in Sweden in car production and done for all the right reasons. And um, in fact stopped in the, in the end for all the right reasons. They actually ended up trying to re, they reinstigated like a process of management in order to create a kind of antagonism within the workplace that would allow people to battle over time again because they didn't, you know, they, they needed to have this sense of a time battle. Um, so I don't know if it's really about utopianism really. I'm, I'm much more interested, you know, that whole work that started in 2004 um, is really about what happens when you have a crisis in a culture that's not supposed to have a crisis. And I, I didn't want to look at the edge of things because partly because I'm not qualified to I'm, it's not my, I, I wanted to look at the gray area, the, the federal, the federated zones, the areas of compromise, strategy, negotiation, redundancy payments, like cultures that feel everything's fine, those places that feel they've worked it all out. And I wanted to write about the idea of a crisis in those kind of cultures. And lo and behold, it happened, right? Now, it's not because I'm a genius, it's because, or I'm a, I can see the future, it's because you know it's there, it's built into the structure already. And I wanted to examine that. Ironically, Sweden, again, had it first because they had a big housing crisis, exactly like a mini global credit crisis in the, either the late 90s, uh, I think in the late 90s. So they'd, they'd, re, they'd instilled like 
high level controls over credit and, and, uh, and so on. But also at the same time, put in place heavy protection for renting, renting accommodation. So if you rented, you could, you, could, you could be protected. And they've almost escaped the entire um, bank crisis yeah. thing. Yeah. Anyway. Who's next? Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, actually, with kind of direct response to what's just been said, um, this, like, these ideas of utopianism or not utopianism, um, specifically to do with the kind of unrest that's been going on across the world. How does that factor into your arguments? Specifically, like, you know, the rights uh, in England, specifically to do with that kind of, you know, some of those very important ideas about what's happened with the crisis how does that factor in and I know like some of your work is very you know you talk about those structures those ar architecture and how people then interacted with that architecture in a very violent way um, in England exactly. and then and also in on a broader level it's happening on a global level you know even here with Occupy slightly different model but it's happening all over the world like how do those things factor into your understanding of utopianism I, do, I just want to say something very quickly about it and then Today, the police in London were marching against the cuts. That's right. That's which I found extremely interesting. So it was yeah. about 30 to 50,000 police, which is a lot of police. And the only thing that I found was actually the first time I thought I saw a real potential for something to happen, something to change <clears throat> in a strange way, because the police announced that if necessary, they would kettle the police, meaning that British technique where you kind of try to neutralize a riot or a demonstration by not letting anyone leave. And you surround them and you won't let anyone leave. If anyone tries to leave the kettle, they get pushed back into the kettle. And they get kept there for hours and hours and hours. And I thought this image of the police kettling the police was kind of something. Yeah. On, on these other matters, I'll defer to Simon, maybe, for a while. A thing that we share is a, um, a an anxious relationship to uh, where we're from, you know, and there's, um, so I wish um, pestilence and plague and fire and death on England. I, I loathe England with a, with a vengeance that surprises me as the years go by and it gets worse. I take no particular pride in that, but it's a fact. The riots were fantastic, I thought. I thought it was just great. I mean, in, in some ways it was, uh, you know, in some, here, here was a reanimation of a very peculiar kind because the, I was living in London when the, um, the riots in 1981 uh, that spread all over, well, they, they began in Liverpool and ha um, Handsworth in Birmingham and elsewhere. But the um, Broadwater Farm Estate in Tottenham, where the, um, uh, the incident began, the, the thing that started the riots, um, was like a sort of <laughs> reenactment of, you know, of what had happened in 81 when it was a police officer that had been killed on that estate, right? And that was the, the thing that lit the, lit the fuse. Now, there's an awful lot to say because um, but at a general level, it's, for me, the question, hmm, not the question, but a, a big question of, of politics for the last century, at least, has been the relationship between working class unrest and middle class unrest. And in many ways, the history of politics turns on moments where those two experiences of unrest are linked and not linked. So if we think about 68, which was largely a student protest, uh, let's say, you know, more or less middle class French students, and for a moment it you mean, seemed... You mean English middle class, meaning... No, I mean, I mean in what was happening in, in Paris... When you say middle class, you don't mean it in the American Oh, not in the, no, not in the American sense, no. Uh, but, you know, the question of whether there could be, whether the... Uh, occupation and defeat of the, uh, the police in the Sorbonne would lead to a general strike, right? And um, the students went into the, the Renault factories and all this, you probably know this history. Anyway, it, 
it happened and it didn't happen. It happened in the sense in which there was an extraordinary moment and then at the end of June of that year, uh, de Gaulle was re-elected into power and it took another sort of 12, 13 years for 68 to sort of work its way through the political system with the election of Mitterrand in 81, which did a reenactment of that last weekend in some sort of faded, uh, grotesque form which we, from which we should expect nothing. Um, but that's by the by. But the question has always been a question of, whether, of linking up uh, forms of, say, working class protest and middle class protest. And it's in that light that obviously you can look at, say, parallel movements in, um, in, uh, in the late 60s here. You know, there was that moment when, the, when SDS uh, people went underground, became the weather underground, and there was, the, there was the, the attempt to form coalitions between the weather underground and the, the Black Panthers and the, the White Panthers and all that stuff. That was an insurrectionary moment, bringing the war home and all of that. It seems that uh, at this point in history, in different contexts, those questions are being posed. There was a great book that came out last year with Verso uh, called Chavs. You know, Chavs in English is council house and violent, um, a term that's used, a term of art that's used to describe the working class. And this is a book on the demonization of the working class. And that demonization of the working class was what was playing out in the response to the riots. And what you should look at, and I was on, sadly, away without an internet connection when a lot of this was happening, so I caught up with this later. But looking at the BBC coverage of the riots, and there was one moment where there was um, an interview with uh, Darkus Howe, who was uh, originally, I think originally Caribbean uh, uh, British politician became a Labour MP for Tottenham for that and he was interviewed on the BBC and he was in a gentle way saying that perhaps something revolutionary was at, at stake here, something was happening and uh, he was, the BBC interviewer said, you know, well, you know, Mr Howe, you have a history of rioting yourself, don't you, I believe and, and he said, you know, anyway and, it, and then they, they cut it from the website BBC website, you can't find that interview anymore it revealed the so there's that. So can there be an alliance between whatever was going on in the riots and what was going on, for example, in Britain with the protest against fees, the student riots, and all the kettling that was happening in November 2010? What forms of coalition are possible between what was going on in the Occupy movement and, uh, and, and wider movements? That seems to be the question. And it seems to me that um, Occupy is at a p particular juncture at the moment, uh, and I mean, my, my view on it changes day by day, and uh, I try and follow, keep up with things a little, but the, um, it seems to me that the, uh, that, that extraordinary efflorescence of, uh, of confidence that happened around Occupy, which for me is, is, has to be linked to an idea of location, and there's another question here that that location was something that looked like an art installation as well, that's another really interesting question. Zuccotti Park looks like a Thomas Hershorn piece, but that's a separate, separate set of issues. But you know, anyway, art and politics. But the link between that and then um, uh, organized labor um, and unions and even the Democratic Party and how whatever was being articulated in Occupy can form the basis for a mass movement. That's, that's the, the juncture that we're at. And it seems to me that it's, um, it's an unpropitious time for there to be an election in that sense, right? Because obviously the, the rhetoric of Occupy is going, is, ha, has already been co-opted by Obama as the language of fairness and equality and diluted at the same, at the same moment. And in a sense, the... Um, the risk now is that the, the extraordinary, and, and this happens in a generation, what happened last fall here happens you know, every generation, that the extraordinary confidence that, that people acting peacefully in concert suddenly understand that they have extraordinary potency as a group, right? And then um, anything can happen, right? Uh, the, 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 the possibility for a dissolution of that energy, uh, you know, I find sad, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, pessimistic yet, but we'll see. The thing is, I, I, I don't want to dwell on it too much or make any... I do think there is a slight problem for certain artists in terms of 
in the last 10 years who've adopted a certain aesthetic in order to indicate an ethical position, that it has been, that's, you know, things have to move on for some of them because I think it becomes more difficult um, uh, when, when that happens. But just to add <laughs> to, add to what, what Simon's saying, that um, I actually think that cause I tend to look at these things structurally and aesthetically, which doesn't mean, obviously, whether things look nice or not, it just means looking at its aesthetic qualities. And of course, you see that there's an extremely precise, well-orchestrated campaign to stop anything happening and to do that in very devious and well-organized ways. So I cannot talk about any of these moments in terms of whether or not they themselves uh, kind of fade or they themselves fail to achieve something because I see the the way the architecture of the environments is manipulated and the way the street is used and the way certain people are singled out for kind of humiliation and punishment that then puts off certain other people. You know, if I see another photograph of a fat white police chief in a white shirt, like with his knee on a woman's face, this is an absolute decision, this is strategy. This is not, these are not idiots. These are people doing this on purpose because they know that if they're going to do that to, to this person, then what are they going to do to you kind of thing? Like this is a it's, a, it's almost, for me sometimes I think it's on the level of, of what they call war crimes. You know, that's that sort of level where you're using terror of the sort of the land or of the, the nation as it were as a technique. Of course, it's much softer than that. I'm not, you know, but it has similar psychological effects and similar um, creates similar fears about what could be. It's not about what's happening at the moment. None of this is about what's happening at the moment. Do you serious? You know, we don't think we know that nothing's really happened. In fact, I mean, I'm not talking about elsewhere in the world, but certainly here, it's in a suspended state. And I think that this is extremely interesting, and um, and it does require. From an artist's perspective, it does require a little bit of a rethinking of where you stand a little bit in terms of what you're letting out into the world. And strangely enough, it complicates things more than, more than it makes them simple. I wish it made it more simple. I wish it made it more simple where to stand. But it means the role of the artist becomes um, maybe, I think, sometimes as a spotter. You know this idea of a spotter? It exists in, in, uh, uh, for people who are... Um, Snipers, for example, they have a spotter because you can't snipe and spot things at the same time. You need someone to point things out. And um, maybe, uh, maybe it's a kind of process of two sets of people pointing out their limits at the moment. And maybe that will produce something. I don't know. Okay, so that, it was really interesting to hear the answer to that question. This one is kind of to do with the difference between Occupy and like the kind of more, you talked about this kind of um, the working class versus the middle class in British terms. But how would you uh, compare the difference between Occupy and the riots here? You spoke of um, this kind of coming together, people realizing it and knowing that there's something in that movement. Whereas it seems to me the riots in Britain were very different than that. Sure. It was very, it was much more, rea almost felt more reactionary and violent and angry. Um, and less thought through. So I wondered, like, I don't know, that's my kind of reading of it, but I'd wondered how you would compare these two things. Um, yeah, but these things, again, they're structural, that, that you do wake up, I mean, occasionally you must have it, and it, you'd have it less here because, okay, let me try and do it in quickly and from my understanding, then maybe you can respond to what I say in terms of my faulty history. But there is something about self-imagination or projection of a, of a culture that is sometimes to do with grand ideas, I think. And that in Britain, there's no constitution, for example. Now, the constitution right now just seems like a, 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 a weird thing to somehow want to hang, hang on to in a way, you know, in that way, to sort of align yourself with a, a constitutional originalist would be kind of bonkers. But strangely enough, it does change some of the relationships, the feeling you can address someone and say, who do you represent? Like, who are you speaking for? Like, who are your people? And that person is supposed to answer you. Now, whether they do or not is another matter, and that's why things get complicated and 
and so on. In Britain, it doesn't exist. There is no constitution. Technically, a, a, a figure of authority cannot demand that you identify yourself because the relationship between you and that person is not clearly defined by law. And this is an extremely complicated situation and not uninteresting. Now, what happens, therefore, is that I sometimes walk around in, in London, for example, and I think, not, isn't it amazing? I always think, isn't it amazing that people aren't rioting? Or isn't it amazing that people aren't just smashing windows and helping themselves? Because there's actually very little there apart from a few cameras and maybe some other people to stop you doing it. And that, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Simon because I think you might know why <laughs> or have thought about it. Because I think this is an idea that's come up before, right? It's like Walter Benjamin well, I mean, or something. The, 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 enigma of, uh, the enigma of politics is how, how is it that the many are governed by the few given that the many are many, right? The many are always many. Um, how is it that the many... Um, subsume or subject themselves to the few who govern them? The obvious answer is guns and sticks, right? Yeah, but my dad always said to me, you can always tell when you're in a republic because they've got bars on the windows. <laughs> and I don't know what he meant, but he was sort of half right in a weird way. It was something to do with the sense of an antagonist, you know, that you have a more, people have a more, I don't know what it is. Carry on, sorry. No, it was, it, it's, um, Meaning a modern republic, like a yeah. post-19th-century republic. I mean, the, the, there's, I mean, states operate through forms of... Um, what's it, the extraordinary thing about nation-states, and this isn't really a nation-state, but let's think, you know, the Western European nation-states classically, is the extent of consent to uh, authority. That's always the enigma. In countries like Britain, where there's no constitution, it's liberties underwritten by tradition, and so on and so forth. Um, in, I don't know where I'd take this. It's, it seems that the, um, in... Um, I'm trying to bring it back around to your book. Oh, right, the book. The whole point is we're supposed to be promoting your book. You forgot. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a book. I wrote a book. I said at uh, the beginning the most difficult thing to do is going to be to end this. Right. So I thought I was I trying wrote. to like feed you a, a line. Uh, I wrote a book. I thought it might have something to do with empathy or some forms of like collective human recognition or something like that. Uh, that prevent the, the just... Let me, let me say this. Let, let me say this. The, um, I won't talk about it, but in the, in the book. No. Can't do that. The extraordinary thing about the American Republic is um, it's a federation. It's, it's a federation. Uh, it's, it, it was preceded by 13 colonies that had strong forms of local government and were relatively extremely affluent in comparison to Western Europe, where people had a twofold identification as Rhode Islanders or as Connecticutians or Virginians, and then secondarily as British. And what Madison crafted in crafting the institutions of the Republic was something that would break down those identifications and lead to the identification with this thing called the Republic. Right? And uh, that came down to questions of territory. And the more you know about this, the more you, know, you think of, people think of philosophy as abstract. They were reading, obviously, Locke, but Hume was crucially important. And Hume thought you could have large republics over large territories and they would work. So Madison thought, let's try it here. And, here we are a couple of centuries later. The point is that um, what there is in place here is an extraordinarily robust civil religion, right? And a civil religion which is based upon um, some premise of the deity in some form, in God we trust or whatever, but the, God, uh, the deity cannot override the constitution, right? So as it were, the fundamental Back to Liam's point, the fundamental fact of American political life is the fact of the Constitution. And it's in that that you have to believe. Questions of politics simply become questions of the interpretation of the Constitution, which is why constitutional lawyers are so important and why the president is a constitutional lawyer, amongst other things. The, but what's somehow released by that or happens under the radar, uh, and this is something which isn't true in a, in a country like in Britain in the same way, is that... Um, there is that 
broad constitutional stuff, and somehow that uh, was consistent with uh, forms of radical local communist groups. There's a great book written in 1879 called The Communist Societies, Communist Societies of the United States of America by someone called Nordhoff, and he plots the history of groups like Harmony, the Shakers, and so on and so forth, that were autonomous communes, basically off, operating off limits in accordance with their own rules, usually in relationship to religion, but usually pretty, pretty wild and out there religion. So what's the point of me saying that? Um, you have that robust civil religion on the one hand, and, that, and that's not something that can be disregarded. It's something that has to be harnessed and re-energized, and the civil rights movement in the 60s was that, was one example of that. But also, you have this um, tradition of deep democracy here, right? deep, direct democracy, which means that something like Occupy uh, feeds directly out of some, or can feed out of some deep folk memory. Now, the last, this, this is the way of, I answer your question, and this might sound patronizing, but I was reading a book at the weekend. I read two books at the weekend, the Book of Mormon, um, which was interesting. I won't talk about that. Um, and, the whole uh, thing. Sorry? The whole thing? No, I just read, but dipped in, dipped in. Yeah. And, um, and uh, this, this fantastic book I by someone called Jonathan Rose called the, the Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. And it's a study of what working class people in Britain in the 19th century read, what they read. And we know more or less what they read. Uh, and what they read wasn't Marx. Uh, it wasn't, you know, radical political or economic analysis. It was Dickens. Mm -hmm. It was Walter Scott. Um, it was Thomas Carlyle. And top of the list always is Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress. Most important text. Now, maybe you'll see where this is going to go. The, what that, what that uh, led to in the early decades of the 20th century were traditions of working class self-education, which were incredibly strong. There was this thing called the Workers' Educational Association. Whether it still exists, I don't know, but I went to Workers' Educational Association classes uh, when I was uh, 19. It was the first time I'd read books, really, much. And um, there was an idea of working class, the, the working class autodidact, right? Which often meant that they were reading, you know, the people written on the walls of the Brooklyn Museum. This idea of, you know, of a completely, as it were, conservative agenda, but which is being harnessed for subversive ends or to, to try and allow for some autonomy. A real question for me is that question of education and where that goes. And this guy rose in this book. Uh, for him, the, the crucial juncture in the history of uh, literacy in a place like Britain occurs with the transition from books to television, right? And so his thesis, which is a kind of, you know, thesis we could think about, contest, is that television eventually kills off that tradition of working class self-education. Now, I'm not sure whether that's right, but whatever uh, is going to happen politically over the next period of time has to turn on the question of education. Right? So politics has become a question of focus groups, a question of interest, and the calculation of interests. And that's always going to be a disaster. Um, the central concern of any politics has to be a notion of education and an idea of what, uh, what it might take to form, um, in, form genuine you know, intellectual independence. And so, um, that in my view, and, and so it's obviously, you know, that's, um, I mean, you know, and, and that saying things like that in the presence of the American broadcast media is sort of laughable, but I think that's what I'd end up saying. And it so came, it came out, no, I have to say, so, it came out a little bit, I mean, it's hard to, I mean, no one's going to say no, are they? It sounded like you were just saying, no, we have to think about education, and they even no, but Mitt like, Romney says no, that, no, probably. The, the most, the most I, I, you, I don't think you mean quite what you said. I think you mean something else. Okay. I, no, I'm, not, I'm just trying to, you know what I mean? No, but the, most, the, most, the greatest Maybe thing I, about the, uh, the uh, Zuccotti Park was the library. Right. 
So you mean a specific type of education? You don't mean education yeah. regardless? Reading books. Reading books. And other things. Not necessarily being trained to do certain things. Uh, discipline that... as well. Discipline as okay. well. I mean, you know, that's and that's... And going back to where we started and, you know... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, whatever it is that we do is entirely dependent upon a certain access to education, right? And a certain access to education that's got a quite interesting history, which is linked to this, right? It was because of the transformations caused by the Second World War um, in, in a country like Britain that led through a circuitous series of routes to the emergence of a series of educational institutions and initiatives that meant that people from certain class backgrounds, such as myself, had access to this stuff. And you breathed this and you drank it in and it was powerful. And you found teachers that would, you know, would, would, it, would allow you to, would give you the confidence to do that stuff. So, you know, that, that's a banality of it, and who's gonna disagree with that, but obviously, you know, um, a huge issue at this point in the US is the question of what education costs, the level of student debt, and all of that. So one thing that I'd like to see, even if it meant me losing my job, which I guess it would because I work for a private university, uh, the emergence of free universities and free educational systems, public school and things, I, th I find this really very interesting. You know, and it's put, it, it's put education, uh, the issue of education back on the agenda in a, a very powerful way. You're so utopian. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's, we should end it like that. Uh, thank you for coming.